think the eyes have it, the eyes have it. I have received notice from the Minister of Health that he wishes to make a statement. Before I call the Minister, I remind members that in light of social distancing being observed by parties, I have relaxed the Speaker's ruling that members must be in the Chamber to hear a statement if they want to ask a question. Members do still have to make sure that their name is on the speaking list if they wish to be called, but they can do this by rising in their place, as well as notifying the business office or the table here directly. I remind members to be concise in their questions. This isn't an opportunity for debate and for long introductions. I call the Minister for Health, Mr Robin Swan. Minister. Um, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you for the opportunity to update the House on my approach to the rebuilding of health and social care services. COVID-19 has wreaked havoc on our community, our way of life, and how our health and social care services are delivered. Things will not be the same again, and we now need to carefully navigate the next phase of dealing with this terrible virus. By, compiling, by complying with social distancing and other restrictions, measures which only four months ago would have sounded so far-fetched that no one could ever have envisaged. The people of Northern Ireland have been instrumental in dramatically reducing the rate of infection. Sadly, however, as of yesterday, 537 of our fellow citizens have passed away after testing positive for COVID-19. No matter how long the pandemic continues, we must never forget that behind every figure was a person who was loved and who is now sorely missed. And with so many families having experienced that grief, we all have an obligation to minimise the rate of infection and future loss of life. My sincere condolences go to the families and loved ones of those who have tragically passed away. The actions we took to control the virus meant that we had sufficient health service capacity to cope with the additional pressures exerted by COVID-19. Our nurses, doctors, paramedics, other allied health professionals, pharmacists, care workers, primary care and other frontline health and social care workers have bravely and tirelessly put themselves at risk to save the lives of others. Among them were also those who volunteered to return to work or temporarily leave training to provide much help and support. I cannot thank our workers enough for that. I know that I can rely upon continued commitment from all our staff as we begin the task of rebuilding health and social care services as soon as possible. With this being Carers Week, it is also incumbent on us all to acknowledge the absolutely essential work of all our carers. Whilst carers have always been key pillars to the local HSC system, this pandemic has further highlighted their sheer contribution to families and throughout the United Kingdom. Many new carers have come forward to look after friends or relatives who are elderly, sick or disabled. And as Minister, I want to thank them wholeheartedly for everything that they have done and continue to do. I appreciate that their efforts, the efforts of our staff and carers, however, have taken their toll. We must put their welfare, along with patient safety, at the heart of our efforts to rebuild services. COVID-19 has presented our health and social care system with its biggest challenge since inception, and that is in the context of the huge strategic challenges facing us prior to COVID-19, all of which are well known as highlighted in the Bagoa Review on the Delivering Together Agenda. These strategic challenges have not gone away. We need to continue to tackle issues such as the impact of an ageing population, increasing demand, long and growing waiting lists, workforce pressures, the emergence of new and expensive treatments, and ongoing budget constraints. The terrible events that have occurred in recent months the loss of loved ones suffered by many families and the restrictions on our daily lives and access to employment and public services has only heightened my commitment to use the resources of my department to better deliver health and life outcomes for all our people. My department's budgetary position continues to be hugely challenging. There have been significant additional funding requirements in our response 
to the unprecedented challenges of COVID-19. The Department has secured additional funding from the Executive to respond to COVID-19 and continues to liaise with the Department of Finance to secure further required funding. Rebuilding health and social care services while simultaneously dealing with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic will require additional resource funding. But let me be clear, as serious as the immediate impact of COVID-19 was and still is, I equally remain just as concerned about the detrimental impact it has had on the delivery of a wide range of crucially important health and care activity. Throughout the pandemic, the HSC has continued to provide high priority and urgent services, such as emergency care and many cancer treatments. However, despite that, a terrible consequence of this pandemic is that for some people, conditions will have gone undetected or untreated. And that's longer than they otherwise would have. Many of us in this House have bitter experience through friends, families and colleagues of what a cruel disease cancer is and how it thrives in a vacuum. And no one is more concerned about the impact of delays that are exceptional cancer than our exceptional cancer clinicians themselves. That is why we all want to see as many of the full services resumed as quickly as possible. I am acutely aware that COVID-19 is not the only thing seriously impacting on the health of the local population. For some time now, I have also been extremely concerned about the reduced numbers of people presenting to primary or secondary care with serious symptoms. COVID-19 has changed all our lives, but it has not stopped people experiencing chest pains or other unexplained signs. That is why my department, along with the trusts, individual hospitals, GP practices and staff groups, have consistently been urging people not to put off medical intervention, if for whatever they suspect they may require it. That is a message I absolutely want to send out again today. I am also worried about the impact of the pandemic and the lockdown on mental health, especially for the most vulnerable in our society. That is what makes our recently published Mental Health Action Plan even more important. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, we have now reached the position where we must remain vigilant and plan for further outbreaks of the virus while starting the work to rebuild the delivery of health and social care services. I would now like to highlight key aspects of the strategic framework for rebuilding services that I am publishing today. I will cover the impact assessment that my department has completed. I will highlight some of the innovations that have emerged in recent months. And I will also set out my strategic approach to rebuilding health and social care services as soon as possible. And finally, I will update the House on a new governance approach to provide the direction and oversight needed to deliver all of this at pace. As the pandemic took hold, it was necessary to protect all of the highest priority health and social care services and create capacity to treat COVID-19 patients. This meant that as resources were redirected, some health and social care services had to unfortunately and unavoidably be curtailed. Whilst this was the right thing to do, the consequence was that some health and social care services were adversely impacted. Most adult streaming screening programmes were paused from the second week of March. This was needed to ensure not only that adequate health care and laboratory resources could be redirected to the pandemic response, but also to reduce the risk of infection by ensuring appropriate social distancing to safeguard patients. However, it is also important to note that some screening services have continued. These include higher risk breast screening, diabetic eye screening for pregnant women, newborn blood spot screening, newborn hearing screening, antenatal infection screening in pregnancy, and smear tests for non-routine cervical screening. Breast assessment and colonoscopy follow-up clinics also continue to be held where possible. Elective care activity also had to be reduced during the pandemic, as our medical staff was redeployed to treat COVID-19 patients. As I have said before, those waiting lists were unacceptable before COVID-19, and they are even more horrendous now. For instance, outpatient activity is down between 40 per cent and 55 per cent. 
and inpatient activity by between 34% and 67%, both compared to the similar period last year. COVID-19 continues to have a significant impact on adult social care, which remains in the surge period of the pandemic. The impact on social care is evident in the presence of COVID-19 among care home residents and staff. A recent survey of providers indicates that 19% of those who responded were caring for residents who had tested positive. A slightly higher proportion, 23% of providers, had employees who had tested positive. As I have already highlighted, I am very concerned about the impact of COVID-19 on mental health. Early anecdotal evidence suggests that there are a large number of mental health presentations previously not known to mental health services. These may well, be, may well be linked with the effects of a reduction of face-to-face contacts and stress related to the pandemic. Important projects and programmes being delivered across the department have also been affected. For example, only two of my department's new decade new approach priorities are now on target for delivery. Work on the other commitments will continue, but unfortunately will be behind schedule. Emerging research indicates that population health is, on balance, likely to be neg negatively affected by the wider impacts of COVID-19. And perhaps the greatest concern is that the most disadvantaged in our society are likely to be the worst affected. We need to carefully monitor the impacts on population health and consider ways in which we can address them, especially for our most vulnerable citizens. Clearly, COVID-19 has impacted extensively across all health and social care services, projects and programmes. There is much more detail on these impacts in the strategic framework and in particular in the appendices published alongside it. So I will now leave the impact assessment and turn to the important issue of service innovations next. I recognise that it may be difficult to find any positives in the situation that we find ourselves in. But we must recognise that the emergency response across primary, community and secondary care services have involved innovative new service delivery approaches. Our health and social care providers have adopted the use of technology like never before. Virtual clinics and telephone triage are now widely embedded with both primary and secondary care services. We cannot go back to the way we delivered services before COVID-19. There is now an opportunity to mainstream these recent innovations as normal services are resumed, and I am determined that we take that opportunity. We also need to factor into our plans the ongoing Encompass programme, which is designed to facilitate greater digitalisation of our services. Of course, we must recognise that use of technology will not be appropriate in all circumstances, and we must continue to offer face-to-face -face services where that makes sense for patients and staff alike. We must also not forget the extensive transformation programme which had gathered pace prior to the pandemic. This will also inform the rebuilding of health and social care services. Our primary and secondary care providers have also stepped up to, collabor to collaborate in ways not previously seen. This is best exemplified in the 11 COVID-19 centres established as a response to the crisis. We must now build on these experiences to further encourage that collaboration. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I can confirm to the House that innovation Transformation and collaboration will be at the very heart of my approach to rebuilding health and social care services. My plans for rebuilding health and social care will be integral to the overall strategic approach to recovery which the Executive will take forward. I will work closely with my Executive colleagues to ensure that the societal, economic and health and wellbeing impacts of the pandemic are addressed across government to ensure that the interests of all our citizens are secured. I will now turn to the strategic approach that we will adopt to rebuild health and social care services as soon as possible. This will involve the development of service incremental plans and three-month cycles. I do not consider it feasible to attempt to plan beyond this three-month horizon, given the high degree of uncertainty we currently face about potential further surges to the virus. Of course, this will be kept under review, and I will adopt a flexible approach to the rebuilding effort. Service providers, including our health and social care trusts, 
will therefore be required to develop successive three-month service plans. These plans will detail how they will increase capacity to resume normal service provision as quickly as possible. It will be critically important that the plans are developed in a systemic and consistent way. We will therefore involve the wide range of existing managerial clinical networks, project boards, task and finish groups, and any other suitable vehicles in the development of service-specific plans for their respective areas. This will ensure an integrated and coordinated regional approach. I recognise the importance of engaging with civic society and stakeholders in the rebuilding of the HSC services. My department will therefore use its existing consultative structure to ensure that we take account of the views of external stakeholders. A key aspect of this work will be a review of existing patient pathways. In light of the constraints and issues that COVID-19 presents, the first three months' plans will cover July, August and September. Further plans will be developed thereafter in three-month steps. I will ask Trust and other service providers to develop these incremental plans through taking account of the constraints imposed by COVID-19. Recent service innovations, opportunities associated with the transformation programme, and digital innovation such as the Encompass programme. The incremental service improvement plans will identify further funding requirements, which I will bring forward to the Executive in the weeks and months ahead. I recognise that it will take time to develop the first three-month plans and immediate action is essential. Our trusts have therefore developed initial service delivery plans for the month of June. These plans will be published today by the trusts and I would urge members to review them to see the specific services that are being recommenced in their own areas. The Trusts have made a number of key commitments, which I very much welcome. These include the ongoing emphasis on high-priority cancer services and other urgent conditions. In addition, during June, Trusts are increasing scheduled daycare, ca daycare cases and diagnostics, including endoscopy and duct I'll give that one a mess. <laughs> They're going to be doing that. And apologies. On determining the extent to which that will be published in the near future. The individual trust plans also published today provide more detail on the immediate actions that they are taking. I would reassure members that I have long made it known to my officials that when services across the cross could be turned on before then, I want to see them turned on. This was not the time to be getting caught up in process, especially as I remain acutely conscious that every day our health service is not operating at full capacity. The longer and the harder it will be to repair the damage that has and still is being done. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, my overarching approach to rebuilding services as quickly as possible involves a strategic regional approach. My immediate priority is to support services where further delay would seriously risk conditions worsening for patients. We need to deliver at pace, and I will now say more about how I intend to do that. The scale of the challenge confronting the health and social care system is daunting. We need to maximise service activity within the context of managing the ongoing COVID-19 situation. At the same time, we need to embed innovation and transformation incorporate the Encompass Digital Programme, prioritise services, develop contingencies and plan for the future. Given the complexity and scale of these challenges, it is more important than ever that our health and social care system is given clear direction and that decisions are taken quickly in a fluid and changing environment. To facilitate that, I have established a new management board for rebuilding HSC services. The Management Board will give clear direction to the Health and Social Care Board, the Public Health Agency, the Health and Social Care Trusts and the Business Services Organisation. This Management Board will consist of senior departmental officials, trust chief executives and senior officials from other key arm's length bodies. The Management Board will be advised by a group of expert advisors and these expert advisors will be invited to provide input and advice to inform the Management Board deliberations as and when required. I envisage that this arrangement will facilitate input from and engagement with a significant range of key stakeholders. 
These new governance arrangements will be facilitated through changes to the existing framework document, which sets out the roles and responsibilities of all the health and social care bodies. The revised governance arrangements will be reviewed on a six-monthly basis, but my intention is to have them in place for at least two years. The rebuilding of services will not happen overnight and will require a response that is both agile and adaptable to ensure the system can respond to further potential COVID-19 surges. As I have said before, my priority is to ensure that the services provided by health and social care are safe and effective. I have no doubt that some will have wanted to see more outcomes and targets in the framework. This will be fully addressed in the three monthly rebuilding plans that my department will publish from July onwards. Above all, we need to increase the available capacity within health and social care services to address the backlogs that have increased since the start of the emergency. That will require new recurrent investment alongside ensuring that the innovation that has emerged during the emergency finds its ways into policy making. Above all, I want to see that there is an acceptance and a willingness across the system to entertain new ideas and to accept change in the delivery of health and social care services. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I am in no doubt that we are confronted with a huge challenge. We must, as a system, try to rebuild services as quickly as possible, manage the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, embed innovation and transformation, and plan for the future, all at the same time. Above all, my wish is no different from the members in this chamber and in the wider community. That is that through good government, sound financial investment and partnership working, we will rebuild our health and social care services. I commit all the various parts of health and social care to this task. I will bring to bear all the leadership and encouragement that I can offer as we move through what will be a period of considerable testing and change for health and social care. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I commend the rebuilding health and social care services strategic framework to the House. Thank you. I thank the Minister for his statement. I remind members that this is not a meeting of the Ad Hoc Committee, so I have no flexibility. Understanding orders, there is an R, and once the R is up, the R is up. Um, the first member that I am going to call is the Chair of the Health Committee, Mr Colin Gildernew. I would like to thank the Minister for coming to the Chamber today and for, for making this important statement. Um, and also to acknowledge each and every one of those 537 individual tragedies that have occurred, but also to acknowledge the huge amount of work that has been done right across the department in terms of dealing with this, with this response. I welcome the, the part of the Minister's statement that uh, indicates that the approach will be one of innovation, transformation and collaboration, mo most importantly. But given that the Minister has established a new management board for rebuilding health and social care services that will uh, give clear direction to health and social care board, to the PHA and to the trusts, will the Minister himself be chairing the management board and to ensure that rebuilding is a priority? And how often will that board formally meet? Um, uh, I thank the Chair for, for his questions. In regard, the management board will be chaired by the permanent secretary. Um, I can be in attendance and will be in attendance as often as possible, but to make sure that it, it meets uh, as, frequently, as frequently as is necessary in the beginning, because the, a similar structure, although not formally, got us into the place during the surge plans that allowed that flexible approach with the department working with HSC, working with BSO, and working with all the trusts that enabled us to get into a position where we were looking at our regional approach to COVID-19. So, as the chair is fully aware through the briefings that we've given him, as, as we were able to move into a surge plan and various steps, depending on how serious the surge of COVID-19 was, this facility allows to take us uh, back out to establishing a functioning uh, health and social care service across Northern Ireland at, at a regional level. Um, in regards to, to the consultation and collaborative response, uh, there is reference within the, the, the document itself, and the member will, will, will see it now that it is published, about how we, we, we talk about staff involvement, new ways of working, and also working along the lines of co-production as well. 
to make sure that it isn't solely that management board taking direction, but there's also consideration and consultation with all the stakeholders and users as well as we take this forward. But the first stage, what we're doing in June, is a quick reflex to make sure we can get as many services up and running again as is possible. I call Ms. Pam Cameron. Well, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement to the House this morning. Um, in, in the face of COVID-19, Minister, we're all aware that the health services have been launched into even deeper crisis than they were before. And I note from the Rebuilding Health and Social Care Service Strategic Framework that the new decade new approach priorities are in disarray, with just two of um, the items showing with green lights for delivery, and that's a mental uh, health action plan and the extra 900 nursing and midwifery undergraduate places over three years. Minister, when will we see something that looks remotely like normal in terms of health care where the physical needs are being met in terms of urgent health care? Um, I thank the, the Vice Chair for her point. Uh, in the document itself on page 15, we have laid out all our new decade, new approach uh, targets, and she's right to indicate there are only two that are green at this moment in time, and that's our mental health action plan. Uh, which we published a couple of weeks ago on the extra 900 nursing and midwifery undergraduate places. And, and I do want to put on, on, on record my thanks for those students, nursing students, uh, medical students, uh, dental students, all who came forward to answer the call in support our health and social care services during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the member asks, when will we see health and social care return to normal? Um, I don't want to put a timeline on that because that's why we're looking at the three-month in incremental steps. Because what we left as a service in January is not something that I think we can go back to because our waiting lists were getting longer. Our nurses were in strike because of pay conditions and safe staffing conditions. So it's about using the opportunity that we have now in, in the, these three monthly review steps to make sure that we have a health and care system that supports the patients that need the urgent care, that, needs routine, that need routine care, but also support our staff across the entirety of our health and social care system, that they are, are safe, confident, and they're supported in the job that they're doing, supporting those people that need the help and care that they actually give. So why I, I'm disappointed that we're not as, as far advanced on our new decade, new approach targets, I hope the member and the House does accept that due to the exceptional circumstances we're in, um, that th those targets were unachievable. But they are still targets that are in the new decade, new approach. So they're targets for the entirety of the executive. Uh, these are the ones that are specific to health. So that's why we have detailed them and listed them in, in this document. Mr. Colin McGrath. Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I begin by apologising to the member for North Antrim, whom I walked in front of when he was making his point of order. Uh, when I entered the room, I didn't see that he was actually doing that. But um, I, I, I welcome the uh, Minister's reference today to providing uh, high priority and urgent care services such as emergency care and cancer treatments. Um, given that there was only one emergency department in the whole of England, Scotland and Wales that was closed as part of the COVID, but yet here we had three that were closed, two of which were within the constituency and served the constituency uh, of South Down. Would you agree with me that reopening these services will help to get us back to normality and in, uh, increase and enhance that patient flow, uh, which will enable people to be able to go uh, to emergency departments and not have to clog up the other centres? And if finance is an issue, would he consider scrapping the COVID centres, which the GP centre ab sector absolutely lament as a waste of time and money, given that some of them see only three patients a day, and yet they have cost hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds to maintain? I'll start with the member's second point first in regards to the COVID. I'm, I'm aware of a number, a small number of GPs who are referring to that as the COVID centres and referring to them like that. I also remember to, to the majority of GPs' representative bodies who have actually seen the benefit of the COVID centres at this moment in time because it has te taken COVID positive patients out of normal GP practices. So the majority of GPs that I'm talking to, and I talk to a lot of them and the representative bodies, actually see the benefits and the positive of the COVID centres. And as we take our incremental steps coming out of the lockdown that we're currently in, there is a risk, and the executive accepts that, and the Department of Health has accepted, as we take those steps out, we could see an increase of COVID 
and again in society as people come out of lockdown that we take these further steps and that's where those COVID centres will come into their own again because they have served the people of Northern Ireland well, they have served the health service provision well and they've actually seen a collaborative working across primary and secondary care that was previously unseen in Northern Ireland before at such a level. So I, I don't accept the members' criticism of COVID-19 centres. Uh, I've, I've seen some GPs who are in that mind, but the majority of them that I'm talking to definitely have seen the benefit of them. But it's how we look at the use of them now and the prioritise and the further utilisation of what they could deliver. Um, in regards to the emergency uh, departments, uh, the member will see when, when the trusts present their, their individual recovery plans as well, there is, re there is referral to a number of emergency, emergency departments and when they may come back online. I, I don't see them coming back on in this first stage in the month of June, but as further down the line in the three month steps, they may be there and that's as the trusts develop where, their need, where they see the need and utilisation. Before I call the next member, if I could gently remind members, they can ask more than one question, but the minister is only obliged to answer one, and he gets to pick and choose. So try and keep it a bit more focused. I call Mr. Alan Chambers. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, I'd like to thank the minister uh, for his statement this morning and for his continuing work and that of his team uh, to protect the public of Northern Ireland, which to date has been with their cooperation. I welcome uh, the Minister's commitment this morning in a statement to rebuilding our health services going forward. My question would be, is the Minister confident that the Finance Minister will make available the funds to deliver his rebuilding plans? Um, I, I thank the, the Member for his question. Um, we have received financial support uh, over the last, last number of months in regards to how we respond to COVID-19 as and when we need it. We've been fortunate in, in the Barnet consequentials that have come from Westminster that has allowed us to do, do much of that work. In regards to, to the funding of the next steps in the transformation, new decade, new approach changes, the challenges to elective care, the support of our nurses' pay banding to, that actually resolve the strike issues were actually all executive uh, commitments. Um, so it's the commitment of the executive and not just the finance minister that we'll have to rely on uh, to make sure our health and social care system is funded to deliver for the entirety of Northern Ireland. I call Ms Paula Bradshaw. And thank you, Minister, for coming and giving your statement today. My question is also regarding the COVID-19 centres. I've been contacted by GPs who have, um, also see the low numbers coming through and are very keen to get back to their own surgeries to deal with the patient backlog. Given the, the large number of vacancies within the GP workforce, how are you planning to man these in the short to medium term, as outlined in the strategic framework? Uh, and again, I, I, thank, I thank the member for, for her question. We are reviewing current workforce provision in those, those centres, so it will be an on-call on basis going forward. But as we still try to manage and prepare uh, for a second surge, if it does come, those COVID-19 centres have proved critical in our response. Uh, when we did develop them, they were copied in other parts of the United Kingdom as a way that they saw primary and secondary care actually working together to tackle COVID-19 and keep it out of our normal GP surgeries, because that's where part of the greatest concern from a lot of the GPs actually came from, that if we were mixing COVID-positive patients with COVID-negative patients in GP surgeries when they were presented, there was a, a, an opportunity for cross-infection. So the COVID-19 centres give an easier route uh, for diagnosis, for treatment, and for onward referral to hospital if, if necessary. So the COVID-19 centres proved useful at this moment in time. As we start to step out um, of, our, of our, our challenge and our, and our fight against COVID-19 and, uh, and we move in our next monthly and three monthly stages, we will look at how we can utilise these centres maybe in different ways, as also as addressing making sure the capacity and the facility is still there to tackle any future surge. Mr. Alex Easton. Principal Speaker, um, could I thank the Minister for his statement and um, welcome what uh, he's been saying. In this statement, Minister, you mentioned about uh, looking for increased funding. Has the Minister any idea or a rough idea how much funding will be needed? And can the Minister also um, give a guarantee as we ramp up uh, outpatient appointments and operations that patients will be able to be treated uh, safely to ensure that they don't catch it, the, the COVID-19. Thank you. 
again, I'll, I'll go to the, the, the member's second question. Um, first, in regards to, to how we make sure that those patients approaching uh, normal service provision, should it be operations or di a diagnosis, uh, that they are kept safe, as well as keeping their staff safe as well. Um, I know the member's sister as well, he's referred to her in the health committee, and I wish her a speedy recovery. But it is to make sure that we have a health service that can provide both co support for COVID patients and non-COVID patients. So it may look at changing how the utilisation of some of some facilities, where they are maybe COVID positive centres and only treating COVID patients, or where they're COVID neutral centres where they are actually treating patients that don't have COVID. So we have to look at how we actually use the physical space, but also support the staff in it as well. So we'll see a complete change and utilisation of how PPE is actually used across all of our healthcare sector uh, in the months in the months, and the, even the year, years ahead. In regards to the, the specific financial ask that he has, I think there's a, there's a paper coming to the Health Committee within the next week or so that will detail that. I don't have it in front of me, but the members, a member of the Health Committee will receive that briefing. Mr Pat Sheehan. I've got a free last count of the school and the population are asked to be righteous. Thank the, the, the uh, Minister for his statement. And uh, I appreciate the difficulties the Minister is going to have in re-establishing normal services in our, our health system. And I also uh, acknowledge that uh, he, uh, he describes this as a quick reflex. However, given that the, the membership of the management board is going to be made almost exclusively from senior DOH managers and other senior managers within the health and social care system, with no involvement from trade union uh, representative groups or patient bodies, does he not think that he has missed an opportunity here? I know he has mentioned uh, partnership working and collaboration in his statement. But the essence of transformation is about co-design and co-production. And uh, I would say to the Minister, does he not consider he has missed an opportunity here to involve everyone in rebuilding the health service and getting back to normal? Um, and I thank the member um, for his point, and it is one that's well made, but when I talk about the quick reflex, it's something that we have to do you know, immediately as, as in regards to the surge plans. As we step services now down, and actually concentrated them in a number of areas about how quickly we get back back to the norm, norm, normality. In regards to to the reference, uh, when the member gets a chance to, to refer to to the document itself, um, page 27 of it actually refers to to the communication with patients and staff involvement to ensure that I have a consistent approach to meaningful involvement of staff in development solutions and in decisions which will affect their working lives. So it is about the, the, the consultation of that. As each trust executive, chief executive comes to that board as well, they will also bring the input from their board members and from their stakeholders as well. So there's a number of references through, throughout this document as well in regards to the new ways of working, and that's to ensure the principles of co-production are embedded in rebuilding the HSC services going forward, uh, as well as co-productions there, 5.7. So it's actually embedded in the document on the management board itself. We don't have that rep representation. Uh, previously within the department, we I suppose we had two structures, maybe three structures, with the TIG, which was the Transformation Improvement Group, which was similar to the body that we have. We had TAB, which was the Transformation Advisory Board, which included the stakeholders and the union membership that the member refers to. We had also the MAG, which was the Ministerial Advisory Group, which was a cross-cutting section of the same organisations that referred uh, directly to the minister that was established by by Minister O'Neill, one of the things I'd done before COVID was actually look at how we, we join that Minister of the Advisory Group and the Transformation Advisory Board into one organisation. So we'd hold those stakeholders actually talking directly to me and engaging with me rather than sitting on the specific board. So, so that, that um, direction of co-production and engagement is there, although those bodies may not be rep represented on the management board. Mr Jonathan Buckley. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement and the strategic framework before us today. 
The Minister has rightly outlined the severe impact on a range of cancer services that COVID-19 has placed across the system here in Northern Ireland. I know this news today will come as some relief to some of those cancer patients that potentially we can get towards uh, a regularisation in terms of services provided. Uh, but would you agree with me that we must adopt the same will and determination as we have against COVID in the fight against ca cancer in Northern Ireland? And you mentioned mental health. Is there any update in relation to the appointment process in a mental health champion, which will hopefully help a lot of those people that are potentially suffering from adverse mental health on the back of COVID-19? Um, in regards to, to cancer, cancer is a scourge that is across the society that is affected. I would say everyone in this house, should it be through a family, friends, or, or colleagues as well. Again, when the member gets the opportunity to refer to the full document, the first thing we talk about in the action, in the action list of Annex A is actually about cancer care. And we lay out a number of strategic and specific directions as to what cancer care pathways used to look like, how we're adopting the innovation that we have seen over the past eight weeks, and what those new pathways to access service will actually look like now. So, so what I will say, say to members, and this is, this is something as a constituency MLA, as a constituency representative, will be hard for many, many, many to take. While we go through these next steps and the number of months, we may be asking people to go outside their normal route to service or route to treatment. Um, so I would rather be looking at how we tackle waiting lists and we stop measuring them in months or even years, but we start tackling them in days and weeks and miles because members may have to travel or individuals may have to travel that bit farther to actually gain a specialised service while we reconfigure what the Department of Health actually looks like so we can make sure we can get people treated quicker across Northern Ireland on a regional basis rather than solely going to their local, local hospital. Because one of the difficulties and one of the discrepancies we saw in the past was that postcode approach depending on what trust an individual actually lived in about how quickly they were, they were being seen and treated. So it's about looking in these next number of months about a regional approach as to how we actually get on top of our waiting lists and start to tackle those seriously adversely individuals who have been adversely impacted over the last number of weeks. Ms. Orlea Flynn. I thank the Minister for his statement and particularly um, his comments the transformation will be at the heart of the um, approach to rebuilding the health and social care services. Um, we know obviously that health transformation um, that is properly funded and based on partnership uh, working with the service users and all those in health and social care is essential to building the future um, of, of our health and social care system. So can I ask the Minister? Um, how will he be working with the Transformation Advisory Board to progress um, transformation? I'm not sure in your response to Pat, is this new management board superseding or replacing the, the Transformation Advisory Board? Uh, no, I think, sorry, and apologies for the confusion. Uh, there, there's the Ministerial Advisory Group, which is akin to the new management board and always was. The Transformation Advisory Board was what was there in the past, plus the Ministerial Advisory TAB, Transformation Advisory Board and Ministerial Advisory Group. So there was the two organisations that were largely the same stakeholders doing roughly the same job. So one of the things, as I said to Pat, and before COVID-19 sat, I started a piece of work to bring those two, two organisations and groups together because they involved, they involved our trade union colleagues and also the service users as well. So it was to bring them into one body that will be able to advise me as minister. Uh, as to how the outworkings of the recommendations that are coming forward from the Management uh, Advisory Group is actually working on changing the direction and what health service provision actually looks like. So it's making sure they're there to consult me rather than being part of the board. Mr. Pat Catney. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And uh, I thank the Minister and his team for producing the, st the strategy. And I completely agree with him that we have to address the wider impact of COVID-19 across the service. Uh, I must say that the strategy makes quite startling reading about the dire situation that the service is in. However, the one thing that is clear is that there is no chance for progress and recovery without the hard work and adaptability and the ingenuity of the health service staff. 
uh, Minister. Uh, I welcome the establishment of the Management Board. My only concern is that it seems quite similar to other existing groups, such as the Transformation Implementation Group and the Transformation Advisory Board. Would the Minister uh, agree with me that it is crucial that this Board is outcomes focused? and that frontline staff who deliver care on the ground are fully engaged in its work? Yeah, and I think you know, I'll, I'll refer to the member to, to my previous answer. That this management group does look like what was, the, was TIG, a transfer, um, transfer um, I can't remember. I, I, it was TIG, it was, the, it was the management board, anyway, TAB was the transformation advisory board, which was the stakeholders. And I refer to, refer to the member to, to my previous two answers. This is about the strategic direction, so this is about management and, and direction of travel. So it is right that it is senior members of, of the department, along with BESO, along with the Health and Social Care Board, and along with the trust themselves. What this document actually does and what this recommendation does is put that into a more formalised structure rather than just simply an advisory structure to me as Minister. Mr Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, mental health and wellbeing, I think, traditionally has been regarded as a Cinderella service in need of massive investment. But the Minister makes clear today uh, that COVID-19 will make a serious situation much, much worse. So is the Minister confident that executive colleagues are aware of the scale of investment necessary to tackle this? Uh, and is he confident they will make that support and resource available to him? Um, I, I can assure the member that my executive colleagues are aware, because I have made them aware. Um, in regards to the future funding of the service, I have a number of, I suppose, a number of bids in with the, the Department of Finance. What we're also aware of is that Westminster may be moving uh, to support the mental health outcomes and support mechanisms of their own health service and there will be Barnet consequentials, hopefully coming to Northern Ireland, in regards to that spend uh, that we'll see coming out of Westminster. And it will be by my, my job as Minister of Health to make sure that the utilisation of those monies are ring-fenced and used to support the mental health provision that has been so uh, needing of central support uh, in the past. has been recognised with the new executive that came in on the 11th of January as a key priority as to how we tackle mental health, health in Northern Ireland. And apology, I just realised I didn't uh, answer the, the appointment of the mental health champion. The formal process of that is well underway, and we hope to be announcing not just the process, but possibly also an interim uh, mental health champion in the meantime until the formal consultation on appointment actually takes place. I call Ms Liz Kimmins. I could ask and thank the Minister for his statement uh, this morning. I think it will be very much welcome that we now have a bit of a roadmap ahead of us to see um, the restoration of services. Um, and I, I want to pay tribute to uh, the Pathfinder Group and my own constituency who have done excellent work over the last three years in ensuring the retention of the emergency department at Daisy Hill. Um, and I think the work of that group and, um, is, is definitely a model that could be used in lots of other areas. So on that note, I would ask the Minister, how, how will you decide what services will reopen first? And can you ensure to avoid a postcode lottery so that those services in centralised sites um, won't be opened first on that basis um, to the detriment of other hospitals such as Daisy Hill, where I have been engaging with the Chief Executive in the Southern Trust in that. and I am um, very pleased to see their, their plan this morning as well, but um, obviously the reopening of the emergency department isn't part of that for this first phase, so I am keen to hear more about that. Thank you. you know, the member describes this as, as a road map. There's no doubt there'll be bumps in this road. Uh, and as we look to that, that opening up of services again, you know, the work that has been done by the, each of the six trusts in bringing forward their initial plans for June you know, ha has been highly strategic, so they're looking at what service provision they can restart as soon as possible without getting caught up in process or implementation, because we do need to get back into a place in the footing where we're providing that health care for the majority of, of the people of Northern Ireland. And as I said in, a, in a, an earlier answer, you know, members may see some of our health care delivery being a bit different because we ask people to look at a regionalised and a Northern Ireland wide service rather than simply going to their local one. So if we start to look at that regionalised service, we'll also start to look at regionalised waiting lists so they're the same across the region, where those people on waiting lists will be triaged according to, to medical and surgical need, and that will be done by, by the professionals who, who always do have, have performed that 
that, that delivery of service to make sure those who are most in need are at the top of those regional waiting lists as well. So hopefully removing or deliberately removing that postcode lottery that we've seen, unfortunately, in some instances in the past. Mr Andrew Muir. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for the statement, and particularly uh, the section under general dentistry, um, opticians and uh, allied health uh, professionals. Um, I have been contacted by many of those people in that industry, um, and the role that they provide, the services provider, are invaluable. I know that as a, a runner in the amount of injuries I have managed to incur and <laughs> re revert into physios. Uh, but one thing they are really looking for is guidance in terms of how to operate, and also financial assistance going forward because of the public health requirements that are going to be put in place, and what consideration will be given to give them that financial assistance so that these services can continue to be delivered for our community. In regards to financial support for the, the, the dentistry provision, I know we have, as a department, put financial support into to dentists uh, to, to keep them operating during this, this difficult time. But to get the services back on, you know, we have established uh, recovery groups that comprise of representatives from the Health and Social Care Board, the representative trade body, and my officials here currently examine how non-urgent services can be resumed. Uh, as well as developing operational guidance. So these groups are expected to report again in the coming weeks, it's, uh, which will inform the decision as to when and routine dental care can start to return. Um, in the context of the recent announcements of a return to dentistry service in the rest of the UK and the Republic of Ireland, the Chief Dental Officer in Northern Ireland has published outline plans for the return of dental services. In Northern Ireland, in regards to the financial support for the other allied health professionals, I think that's something the Minister of Economy was looking at, rather than through the, the, the Ministry of Health, because some of those service providers are operating as individual businesses, rather than providers for ourselves. But there is support and guidance there available. Mr. Mark Durkin. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his statement. The Minister and members have, have spoken of the impact of the pandemic and lockdown on people's mental health, and it's fair enough to presume that there's going to be an ongoing increase in need for support and services. But the pandemic is also having a devastating impact on community mental health uh, services, particularly community and voluntary organisations and charities who have yet to receive any financial assistance. With demand increasing and important preventative and early intervention uh, projects being severely depleted, I think it is fair enough also to assume that more people are sadly inevitably going to reach crisis point. With that in mind, would the Minister concur with me that it would be extremely short-sighted, in fact it would be scandalous, should the Executive choose not to fund the Community Crisis Intervention Service in my constituency? The, the member has written to me, he's texted me, he's, he's been in regular contact about uh, the service he's talking about and it is something that I've asked my officials to look at in regards to how we support the mental health um, action plan as well uh, and also protect life too fund as well to see what opportunities they are because I know that uh, the, the additional provision that has come from the local council I think has been been challenged as well because of the financial situation that it, it, it finds itself in. in. In regards to the support for charities, the member will be fully aware that uh, the Minister for Communities um, has a support mechanism there and has funding to support charities at this moment in time. And uh, I'll check with her to see where that support is and how that's actually been relayed to those charities that actually need it at this moment in time. Mr. Roy Beggs. I too would like to thank the Minister for his statement and put on record my appreciation of health and care, and indeed the volunteer care staff and the volunteers who have assisted over the recent period. In the Minister's statement, he's referred to the need to mainstream innovation that has been learnt recently, and he also refers to the Encompass programme. Could the Minister uh, give aspects of recent innovation uh, and which can lead to improvements in the quality of health care for the wider community? Um, and I thank the member for his point. Encompass was, a, I suppose, a digitalisation programme that was, was in place before COVID. Um, but I think what we've seen now in the past, past period while we've dealt with COVID is the utilisation of, of digitalisation and online and telephone triage uh, that has actually worked and is actually supportive, but always bearing in mind 
that there is a point in time where face-to-face -face consultation is the best way forward. So it's those innovations that we've seen about telemedicine stuff that has always been has been talked about in the past, has been supported in the past, but never actually ad ad enveloped and adopted. Whereas we're actually seeing those those advances now being part of common practice, and it's how we embed that innovation actually into our day-to-day -day delivery, and we don't take the step back into those gains that have been lost. And it's also support that we've seen now coming between our GP practices and community pharmacies. So we've seen a far better working and collaboration between them as well. And it's about the general breakdown of what uh, would have been perceived in the past as silo mentalities, which weren't silo mentalities, but were simple ways of working that had been developed over a period of time. We've seen those broken down. We've seen that mentality cracked um, over the past, past number of weeks. And it's about how we take forward this piece of work to make sure that all those good developments, all those relationships that have been built, all those working practices that have been developed and they're actually working well, are now embedded in the service come forward. Mr. Justin McNulty. I would like to thank the Minister for his statements and for his role in uh, endeavouring to navigate these uncharted COVID-19 waters. I note the members from my constituency this morning, Minister, received a copy of the Southern Trust rebuilding plan by email. The plan sets out phase one that runs to June 30, and phase two, which runs up to September 30. And given, given the potential hidden consequences of the fear that people have of attending their health service during this pandemic, um, could you apply whatever pressure you can to ensure that that's reopening of Dizzy Hill Emergency Department occurs as early as possible in phase two of the plan to reopen services. And I think the member, and the member will, as he said, he's already an, an opportunity to, to read the, the entirety of, of, of the trust plan. So the trust themselves are bringing forward those stage recommendations. And as I said in my statement earlier on, our first stage will be what we do in June and that's stage one. Then we'll be looking at a three month increment. So it's always cognizant of, of where the service delivery is, but it's also cognizant of, of well, as I said in my statement as well, of how we support our staff. Members must always, always be remind, um, mindful of when we talk about service delivery, when we talk about things come back to normal, we're asking people who have put themselves through physical hell, and excuse my language, Principal Deputy Speaker, over the past number of weeks, who were at a point in January standing on picket lines over their pay conditions and safe work standards, and who stepped up to an intensity and a, a delivery of a service that no one in this House, I think, could ever imagine at that point in time. But each one of those healthcare professionals, no matter where they are or where they were on the spectrum of delivery, delivered a service that saw us now in a place where we've recorded zero deaths for the past two days. And it's the delivery of those people. So when we talk in here about simply, you know, return this service, return that service, yes, whereas we want to get back to as many service provisions as quickly as possible, we must also be mindful that the people we're asking to get back into those places do need a wee bit of space to recuperate, to recharge their batteries as well, because we are just now coming out of what was a terrible pandemic. And I hope we continue to take the trajectory that we have over the last few days. Ms. Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement today on the rebuilding, reopening and transformation of the health and social care services. I welcome and echo his call again that if people do require medical intervention for whatever reason, and they suspect they might require it uh, to do so, as this has come up, I'm sure, to most members via constituents. But I would like to ask the Minister how he, alongside the Trusts, can ensure that women have access to contraceptive services and early medical abortion services as a part of this rebuilding strategy when required. I'm aware that that provision was, I, I think, debated um, in the chamber, I think, last week or the week before. In regards to the delivery of abortion, I think it's a, a service that should be, or a provision that should be debated in this House, undecided how it's delivered in Northern Ireland, and not something that's imposed on us by Westminster. Uh, at this moment in time, it's not a, a, a provision that has been commissioned by de my department, but I'm aware it has been delivered by some trusts. Mr. Tim Allister. Thank you. Um, as the Minister moves from the, our service from the National COVID Service back to the National Health Service, um, can I express disappointment that in Phase 1 of the Northern Trust, 
there is no return of the maternity services to Causeway. Uh, can he give us any indication when that will happen and that this isn't a service that's been stripped out never to return? In terms of the framework going forward, is there not a danger with new advisory boards, new management boards, three monthly service plans, expert advisors to this and that? Has it not got the feel of a bureaucracy bonanza? And is there a danger that the whole thing could get caught up in ever strangling red tape? Um, I thank the member for, for his questions, and I'm glad I wasn't able to shield from him in, in his direct questions, as he accused other mem members and ministers of earlier on. In, in regards to the, the bureaucracy you refer to, Mr. Alistair, I, I think this actually removes away from that some of that bureaucracy and the ability for some of those boards and structures uh, to hide behind uh, bureaucracy and decision-making because this management board is that of senior executives and trusts and senior de departmental officials answering to myself as minister. And where I see the need of our health service is not one that's going to get caught up in bureaucracy or strangulation. And I'll be back in this house and the member is free to challenge at any time if he sees that as a direction that this structure is going. The three-month review allows us to take those steps uh, to make sure, as he refers to the national COVID health service, because that's what we became for a number of weeks while we challenged this, to make sure that we step back to where we should be in the delivery of the services that we were delivering, uh, but also always mindful that there may become a time where we need to step back into that support of COVID. In regards to the delivery of maternity back to Causeway, uh, that's within the Northern Health and Social Care's stepped approach. At this minute in time, in the first phase plan, they're not seeing that return in, in the month of June, but I'm assured, and I have seen correspondence in the past where they have said it is something they're planning in the future. I don't have a timetable for that at this minute in time, but if I do get one and do see one, it is something they've assured that it will return, but there's no timetable on it at this minute in time. And I know from the member from a constituency point of view, it's something that he has championed and argued for and returned to make sure the causeway is there to deliver for the people of East London Derry on North Antrim. Mr. Jerry Carroll. Thank you. I thank the Minister for his statement. Um, the Minister obviously mentioned mental health. There's a lot of concern about the likely increase in mental health problems after this uh, pandemic and people presenting with those problems. And I think it needs to be reflected in allocation and spending uh, of budgets uh, from the Department. Uh, can I ask the Minister, given the much welcome support and praise and clapping for our NHS uh, and its staff, including Curers, what assurances can he give uh, that any transformation will not mean a uh, whittling down or privatisation of our already existing health services? Can he assure us there will not be a shock doctrine approach to our NHS? I can answer the member in one word. Yes, I can give you that assurance. This isn't about the privatisation of health service. One of the greatest things that has supported Northern Ireland through the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is the fact that we have a national health service. We have a health service that is free at the point of use, free at the point of delivery, and it's something that I'm proud of. It's something that uh, when we do go out or have went out on a Thursday night and clapped, it's for the entirety of that national health service. I will utilise provision on support from our private sector, as we did through the past number of weeks, to make sure we had capacity. If we need to utilise that capacity now to get on top and uh, tackle some of our waiting lists, I will use it, but I will give the commitment to the member that I see no opportunity or I will take no opportunity while I am Minister to see any further privatisation or any privatisation of our National Health Service. Thank you, Minister. Because members were uh, concise, we now have actually about 20 minutes left. So if any member wants to ask an additional question of the Minister, if they rise in their place or try to catch my eye, I will call them. And I see Mr Gildernew. Um, Gorham Haggard, last can I call you. I suppose, uh, Minister, I'd just like to ask in relation to the existing health inequalities that we have here, what plans are being included, where we rebuild, that we rebuild in a way that address and tackle those health inequalities? And, uh, you know, again, I, th I thank the Chair for his statement. 
In regards to why we do take this regional approach managed by this board, it should tackle and it will tackle you know, discrepancies that we've seen in the past. When I, and I referred maybe inadvertently earlier on to the silo mentality. That's not a criticism of any of our trusts in the way they've operated. It's just because of the day-to-day -day operations that they have, the restrictions they have of working in a geographical area, that that's the way their service has been focused. So it's how we utilise now um, that cross-region working, that cross-sectoral uh, working, should it be primary, secondary, uh, community, to make sure that we're all coming together for the same focus, and that's for the health delivery for the people of Northern Ireland. Mr Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, one, one of the um, key fundamentals that we have seen within our health service uh, during the COVID-19 crisis is the abuse that was before COVID on our a &E. mm -hmm. Has the Minister given any consideration, or is there anything we can learn from COVID that prevents the future abuse of a &E services across Northern Ireland that are putting strain upon our health workers that we have quite rightly championed throughout this crisis? Yeah, I, the Member is right to highlight that. You know, that's one of the things, you know, when I come into this post on, on the 11th of January, which seems a long, long time ago, the two of the biggest factors that we were actually tackling was waiting lists and the time spent in our emergency departments and those people who were utilising them that maybe didn't need to be there. Not because they were abusing the system, but maybe there was a better provision within the service elsewhere that they should be seeking help from. So the establishment of our MDTs uh, within GP practices that could provide physiotherapy support, can provide mental health support, um, the utilisation maybe of COVID centres um, for, for those who are COVID positive or maybe looking at a different utilisation uh, for that same facility going forward may be an opportunity where we take that ease off our emergency departments. There is a major piece of work that had, had already commenced uh, within the department in review of our emergency departments that should be coming to fruition in the next number of weeks. And it's looking about how we do things differently. One of the things that was actually involved in that review was the utilisation of telemedicine and telephone triaging. Um, at a point of view, and that's something that is now established well within our health service, and it's something that can be actually used to take that pressure off our emergency departments. But one of the things, and um, I would highlight, you know, it's while while we have stood in the past uh, and clapped and commended our health service workers, um, I was disgusted to see at the start of this week that we had 35 attacks on our ambulance crews. So you know, while we talk about the great work that our people are doing, there are still those people in society who not just uh, look to abuse our system, but are still abusing our staff. People who have put themselves on the front line, put themselves at risk, and even through this situation with COVID, actually put their families at risk in time. So I think I want to take this opportunity to condemn those people who still see our health service workers as an easy target, because I think there should be a provision at some point in time where an attack on any health service worker feeds the full force of the law. Mr. Colin McGrath. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you for the additional questions. I suppose we're like kids in a sweet shop being told we've an extra 20 minutes for them. Um, and following on somewhat from the last remarks, uh, maybe we would ask a question. You've talked about, uh, Minister, the um, reviews that will take place within the trusts. Does that include the ambulance service as almost the sixth trust that's almost forgotten about at times? I know that they um, found that there was a, an easement during the, the, the start of the process because people weren't attending ANEs, but that, those numbers are starting to increase. We're starting to see the ambulance corridors and hospitals starting to back up. And being like you are myself from a, a rural constituency, you know that it is ourselves that end up with our ambulances trapped in the cities and not able to move out. And, and I met yesterday with the chief executive of the ambulance service who over cases on two or three occasions where people had to wait 45 minutes for an ambulance uh, whenever it was in dire need. So is that form part of this review? Um, I would say to the member, and if, if he refers back or if he looks back to some of the comments I made, I talk about our six trusts, which includes the ambulance service. It always includes the ambulance service because they're an integral. They are, they are a regional trust, so they do work across all their departments as well. So um, the pressures that they've been under, not just th those attacks, but also as we start to see that increase of, of need again, um, is something that we're conscious of. During the pandemic, we had to step down our helicopter emergency service. Now, fortunately, it is back up and running again and providing that critical service to the rural constituencies that the, that the member refers to, because now is a vital, a vital part of our health, 
or our health family that we can actually utilise utilise that. In regards to the waiting times in, in EDs and those ambulance corridors that he he was talking about, there was a point when we were seeing the. I suppose, a, a, a lesser use of our emergency departments where they weren't such a problem. But what we now have as well is, is that utilisation starts to increase with the additional fact of social distancing as well, which is present in our emergency department and waiting rooms. That's putting additional weight on those, those ambulance times as well. But as some we're cognizant of, some we're supporting uh, the ambulance service while we work through this, the, this step-out plan as well. Um, when the, the trust plans are published, I think they already have been. There's one already in there and includes one as well for the ambulance service. Mr McGrath referred to a sweet shop. Please don't gorge yourself with 13 minutes and six members looking to get in. Mr Mike Nesbitt. Principal Deputy Speaker, thank you very much. Um, earlier on, a couple of members made reference to the call by some to wrap up the COVID-19 centres on the basis that it's not the most efficient use of resource and funding. But given the second wave of coronavirus is still a distinct possibility, would the Minister agree that the expression, better safe than sorry, trumps all other considerations? Yeah, and I think in regards to, to how our planning has been progressed over the past 10 weeks, that's, that's one, one of the factors we've always taken into consideration, that it is making some of the, these decisions a little hard at the time. Uh, I was always looking to that worst case scenario where we could have seen ourselves. In regards to the COVID centre and, I, I, and my answers to, to members are there and, and my, my robust defence of them is the fact that we have seen on the number of GPs and GP representative organisations who speak highly of them, um, I actually see them as a critical piece of their frontline service as to how we were fit to manage COVID-19 by keeping those patients out of the normal GP surgeries and that normal run of the mill. And if we do see a second surge as we take our, as the executive takes the easements going forward, I, I'm no doubt we will see an increase in COVID because as we allow people to come back out into the normal way of life, coming out of lockdown, uh, accessing retail, accessing leisure facilities, accessing uh, tourism, hotels, all the rest of it over the next few weeks and months, that there will be an increase of COVID cases in Northern Ireland. And we need still the, the facility and the structure to support those people when they need it. And the COVID centres, I think, have proved beneficial in doing that. Ms Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I appreciate it. If people did not misrepresent my question, my question was about how we were going to manage the COVID-19 centres and get our GP surgeries back up and running with an overstretched GP workforce. My second question relates to the pharmacy, um, community pharmacy services. Um, we in the Health Committee we put through the regs relating to the emergency supply service, which, which has been obviously very beneficial. I'm wondering if the time now right for a more um, long-term routine repeat prescription service to be available between our community pharmacists and GPs, given how effectively they've worked together during this pandemic. Thank you. Um, in, in regards to, I, I think, the members' points and, and pharmacy working with GPs, it was one of the, the innovations that... Um, I spoke of because, you know, in the early stages of the pandemic, um, staff capacity actually fell by, by 70, below 70 per cent in the recent weeks. It has improved to 80 per cent within our community pharmacy. And the new emergency supply service that was introduced, which provided access to prescriptions and medicines in the event that a patient had run out of their repeat medicine and they couldn't access their GPs, so that enhanced uh, facility was in place. It's something that has worked well. It's something in collaboration with community pharmacy, um, our chief pharmacist and ourselves having that conversation about how we adopt the changes that were made. Also, the delivery service and community pharmacy that was supported by mostly volunteers coming forward to deliver, I think, at last, the last count we've seen in collaboration between the Health and Social Care Board and the Community Development Health Network uh, led to 120 community groups actually registering to deliver prescriptions. And at the point last week, there was actually 33,000 prescriptions have been delivered by volunteers and delivered safely. So it's not just about the repeat prescriptions, it's about how that entire community pharmacy um, service is, is now provided going forward, because they were a vital link. They were a crucial link um, over the past number of weeks while we combated um, COVID-19. And again, many family-run uh, family shops, family-run services who were putting themselves at the front line. And at the very initial point, like uh, as I referred to earlier on, at the very start took an awful lot of abuse and uh, criticism from frustrated 
people going into to the pharmacies as well. So they stood up for a lot that they've adapted and they are in need uh, of additional support from ourselves and the health department from the executive, but also to make sure that we adapt any positive working collaborations they have with GPs that are actually embedded into future service provision. Ms Pam Cameron. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask another question. I was also going to ask around uh, the pharmacy issue, given that pharmacy um, ha have really become the front line uh, in this pandemic and have been there um, throughout and have worked incredibly hard. So I wanted to ask you, uh, Minister, what uh, additional support you're planning to uh, give pharmacy and um, what conversations are you having with them uh, in regards to what role they can play in, in transformation going forward uh, in the midst of the pandemic? Again, I, I thank the member. I met them um, last week or the week before uh, at, a, at their board level and had, uh, had a very good engagement with them because there has been extensive work um, that has been completed in recent weeks involving the department, the HSC board and community pharmacy in Northern Ireland to agree uh, a new commissioning plan for communities pharmacy services for the rest of, of this year, 2021. Uh, and that will build on lessons learned in the pandemic to date, to date to ensure that pharmacies continue to provide the public with, with the access to medicines, uh, advice on treatment for common conditions and support for their, their health and well-being. But the pharmacists and pharmacy teams and trusts have adopted their working practices and introduced new and innovative solutions as well. Actually working on ICUs, uh, clinical pharmacists and clinical, cl te clinical technicians joined their colleagues in those critical care teams. So pharmacists have actually used the technology to hold virtual clinics to maintain contact and support for their patients taking specialist treatments. But that engagement that has been, and it's been a positive engagement between the Department, the Health and Social Care Board and Community Pharmacy in Northern Ireland, I hope will bear fruit in the next, next few days, if not weeks. Mr Pat Sheehan. The Minister refers in his statement to experts who will assist in the rebuilding strategy. Will the Minister identify uh, these uh, experts and will he also commit to transparency, not only in terms of their identity, but also in terms of public accessibility to and visibility of their advice, contrary to the SAGE approach in London, which was very secretive. Am I good? Um, certainly, I'll give the member that commitment. If we do bring in, a, we'll, we'll make sure they're named and what advice they give as published. Pat. Ms. Liz Kimmins. I'm going to ask in court and thanks um, to the Minister again for the opportunity to ask another question. I suppose as we are in Carers Week, I think it's very important that we pay tribute to the thousands of unpaid carers who have very much um, held court, for want of a better word, um, as we go through this pandemic with um, the closure of day centres mm -hmm. and things like those facilities, which are a major lifeline to um, help them through a very, very difficult time. Um, so I just wanted to ask the Minister for an update on, in relation to the reopening of day centres um, and respite services. I know in the plan that, that um, we are working on um, you know, towards that. Can we ensure that that's a top priority? A lot of families feel that they've been very much left to their own devices, so it's ensuring that the support is available to them uh, going forward. No, and you know, the member's right, and this is, this is Carers Week, so it is right that, uh, that their, their commitment is acknowledged because over the past number of weeks, they have went over and above what was ever expected of, of that service and support that they give to their own family members and loved ones without, without additional support that were there through the respite centres and were always relied on for that peace of mind and that, that, place, um, that place of support that were given to their loved ones as well. So as we take forward, as I said, this stage one gets us to the end of June, then each trust will look at a three-week, or sorry, a three-month uh, reflex and I make sure that those respite centres and those central day centres are as soon and as far up those priorities as, as is practically possible, always taking into consideration the, the health and well-being of not just the users but the staff as well. Four minutes, three members. Short questions, short answers, please. Ms Rachel Woods. Principal Deputy Speaker, and for the additional question time, and I'll refer back to my previous question and answer. How can the Minister ensure that women have access to contraceptive service, contraceptive services as part of this reopening and rebuilding strategy when they require it, given that these services have not been available? 
I, I referred to in my previous answer, these services are available through some of the trusts being delivered at a trust level, not by a central departmental commission service. Mr. Jim Allister. Level of reliance by the health service on the private sector and how he sees that evolving going forward. And I, I, I think I'll refer member back to, to my answer to, 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 to Jerry Carroll as well. Currently, we're, we're using some of the, the independent service to make sure we can uh, keep up to date with red flag cancer services and a number of other, other procedures at a, at a daycare uh, level. Uh, what I see going forward, if I have the financial support, a new, new decade, new approach. Um, there was an offer or a bid of £50 million per year to tackle waiting lists, uh, and that would, uh, would have seen the utilisation of some of that money going to the independent sector, because it's the only way we could have got on top and actually challenged some of the waiting lists that we were seeing. So it's making sure we use the independent sector where it's available, where it's appropriate, but also making sure that if there's additional money that is actually invested in our national health service. So there is a supplement, not as to be completely relied on as the independent sector. Mr. Paul Given. Deputy Speaker, thank you, Minister. Can the Minister advise in terms of transform, uh, transforming that we're in restarting uh, the health service? Routine surgeries and theatres are going to be opened up for people that are vitally uh, waiting on that appointment, which still some haven't got. And secondly, as we reopen um, our economy and every other aspect, the World Health Organization has said that one metre uh, is the advice that they're providing. When will we move from two metres to one metre in line with the World Health Organisation? Because that will be critical in going forward to some kind of normal resemblance of society. Um, and the re-engagement of uh, service provision, that's what we're doing, that's what this plan is, is currently all about, about how we op open up uh, those theatres to make sure we can get back to delivering the service and the operations that people have been waiting on. But, and it's also we're getting to the point where as people were getting a six-week notification of any procedure they need, you know, we'll be cutting that down. As we reopen, those notifications will be shorter. So people, if they get a notification of needing or having access to provision of health care and operations, I would ask them to move as quickly as possible. In regards to the two metres versus, versus one metre, um, our, our scientific advisory group that we have uh, feeding into the Department of Health, which feeds into the executive as well, is still very much in the position that two metres is the right measurement at this minute in time, because what members have to be cognizant of, it's two metres at 15 minutes as an engagement of a positive case. So if you reduce that measurement from two metres to one, one metre, you also have to reduce the time that people actually interact uh, to provide that that positive transmission of COVID-19. Um, the, the recent estimate I got was uh, for, for where we stand now, at two, two metres for 15 minutes, if we reduce it to one minute, it could be as little as three minutes interaction. So when it comes to contact tracing, when it comes to uh, finding out who a positive case could have transferred COVID-19, there are larger implications than simply access and uh, facilities or utilisation when it comes to the physical distance of two metres to one metre. It's also about the time uh, of the interaction as well actually greatly reduces um, at, the same, at, the same, uh, at the same measurement. So that has to be t taken into consideration. At this minute in time, our recommendation to the executive is still two metres. Thank you. That concludes questions to the Minister on his statement. Can I thank the Minister for coming to the House and taking an hour's worth of questioning and wish him all the best as he leads our health service during this time. Members would just like to take their ease for a moment before we move on to the next item of business that will allow other ministers to get into the chamber. Thank you.